Yeah. We're good? All right, well, good morning officially. <laughs> it's good to see all of you. Good to see some of you in the lawn. This is fun. Uh, it's I like that we're having one of these, but it's not as, as tight as it was. I mean, this you know, may be something we just do once in a while. Uh, I'm going to make just several announcements and kind of cover all of that. Let me start with this. Um, we are still, if you have an offering that you would like to give, we are still going to be able to take that up. Um, I'll make a few announcements and then we will take the offering. So we've got Mike who's going to take it up for Mount Tabor and I think Jim is helping for, for Jared. And so I'll, I'll make the announcements and then we'll take the offering up and then We'll get into the message. So um, no evening service tonight, and uh, and there won't be any next week either uh, because of annual conference next week. Um, uh, we've got a note here that uh, each year we honor the graduates from, from Mount Tabor, and no matter the grade they have completed, we also recognize extended graduates from the church family. So if you want them to be recognized on the graduate Sunday here in a couple of weeks, please get a hold of Barb Ratliff. Uh, she has several of the kind of graduation sheets that you fill in for when we put all that together with her this morning. So if you have someone you'd like to recognize, uh, get with Barb. She's sitting sort of straight out in front of me there in the middle, and uh, uh, she has those. So I uh, want to uh, get that in ASAP. Graduation Sunday will be the 26th at Mount Tabor. Uh, Thursday, the, the 16th of June, uh, the Mount Tabor... PPR will meet for just a little bit at, at 6.30, and then the admin council will start at 7. Uh, PPR meetings are closed meetings, so those are just for the committee, but the 7 o'clock meeting is open to everyone, the admin council <laughs> meeting. So please come. That will meet upstairs in the sanctuary. Uh, the annual conference is this week. So we will leave out actually on Tuesday, and uh, the conference itself begins Thursday. We'll be up there early working with the communications team. I am probably running sound again, looks like, for uh, for a lot of the events of, of the conference. So, But Thursday through Sunday, be praying for the conference. I, I don't know of anything super controversial that's, that's up at our conference this year. They are talking about uh, realigning some of the district boundaries. Uh, we will still likely remain... Uh, in some version of what is Midland South, although it probably won't be called that. We're going to be combining with a portion of the Western District. Uh, the, the reason they're doing that is so that each of the districts will have approximately the same number of churches. Because right now we have some that have a whole lot more than others, and that'll make it a little easier for the superintendents. So be praying for conference this week. Uh, of course, next week is conference Sunday, so we will still be up there. Uh, Laura Dyer is going to be filling in again for me uh, at both services. So she'll be, uh, I know you guys will enjoy her, and uh, we've talked to her after she's been here each time, and she loves she loves you guys. She says you guys have all been so kind and, and wonderful to her, so I know she's looking forward to it, and I'm sure you are too. Uh, Father's Day is the 19th, so a couple of weeks from now, and uh, at, at Tabor, at least, the men will be directing the service. We'll have, we'll have the special recognition for fathers. Uh, we have, and for both churches, we have moved Communion Sunday to that day. So uh, we didn't want to do it today just because we didn't want to take that chance. Uh, so we've moved it to the 19th. Uh, ice Cream Social at Jarrett on the 26th of June at 5 o'clock. Everyone is invited. So, <coughs> excuse me, come down and enjoy some ice cream. That's also graduation recognition that, here. Right, yeah. That was, we've got graduation Sunday, as we said, uh, that same day in the morning here at Tabor. Uh, the uh, combined... Picnic will be at the activity building here on September the 25th. So go ahead and mark your calendars ahead for that one, September the 25th, for that combined picnic. Uh, that'll be after both worship services have concluded. So make a note of those things. Uh, one last note, and that is just that due to our struggling through COVID this last week and conference and all that stuff, uh, we're kind of putting the newsletter on hold for June. So it will come out again in July. <coughs> Excuse me. So just be aware of those things. And I'm going to ask uh, Mike and Jim if they will go ahead and begin to take the offering. <coughs> this is allergies this morning. I haven't coughed in days. It's the most talking you've done. It's also the most talking I've done in a while. And I haven't even preached yet, so you all say a little extra prayer if you would.
doing that thing where it's leaving a thin little layer of the label Sorry. on the cough drop. Uh, well, we've got a little gap here. Let me just say again, thank you to so many of you. Oh my goodness. Uh, we have folks from both congregations who called and checked in and wanted to know if they could help or wanted to know if they could bring things and several folks brought by meals or brought by food and other folks asked even after other folks had already done that and so we were going to end up with a lot more than we needed so i know we said to some of you that we were good that was because some other folks had asked you know in that same range and had gotten to us first but thank you all so much uh we we were in a place where we were going to like be planning on grocery shopping at the beginning of the week and obviously we weren't going to be able to do that and most of you didn't know that and you brought enough that we had no trouble getting through the week i mean that was just that was a, a real blessing so i want to just say thanks to everybody who helped us out and folks who have been praying and calling and checking on us and texting and and all of that it means the world i mean that was that was really really cool and i, I appreciate that very much uh, one other note, and then we'll bless the offering, and, uh, and that is just if you've noticed the new white lines on the parking lot, Bill Armantrout has been out here this week with paint and a four-inch roller, and he has done all of that. And so I want to say a special thanks to Bill uh, for, uh, for painting the lot. Uh, he's still working on parts of it, he says. He still has to get some blue paint and a couple other things, but I think it looks great so far, and uh, I greatly appreciate him volunteering to do that. So uh, Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we pray that you would bless these offerings that have been given this morning and that you would use them in the churches to upbuild your kingdom. Lord, that these things would be things to help keep the church going and help us to keep reaching out into our communities and shining that light for you. Lord, bless the gift, bless those who give, bless those who are not able to give. And we will give it all to you in the name of Christ, our Lord. Amen. All right. Well, before we get into the message, I do just want to have a more general word of prayer. Uh, we've had a lot of folks send requests this week, and I know we're not really in a place to take prayer requests from all over the parking lot this morning. I think that would probably be a little tougher. But I do want to pray anyway, just in general, for our needs and requests and those things that, that we're all dealing with, because I know we've had uh, quite a lot over the last few weeks. So let's bow for a word of prayer. God, as we come this morning, we are thankful that we can gather at your house, even if we're not gathering inside the walls. Lord, we know the church is so much more than just the building. And uh, through many drive-in services before, that was proven over and over. And, and Lord, again this morning, even as we're gathering outdoors, we're just so thankful for your presence, no matter where we are. Thankful for this group and these folks who've come out and those who are joining us worshiping online as well. Lord, the church near and far. And we're just so thankful. We pray that you'd be with those needs that have come to us this week, Lord, various health needs that we've heard about, folks who are having surgeries or who have recovered or folks who are dealing with injuries or sickness of other things. And, and Lord, we lift all of them to you and ask for your healing grace to just pour out upon all of these folks, Lord, that you would move and you would touch and heal as only you can do. Lord, work through the doctors and the medicines and the procedures and surgeries and everything else, and Lord, be glorified in all of that. Lord, for the burdens that people may be carrying otherwise, no matter what those are, we ask that you would touch and lift those. And Lord, that the weight would get a little easier. Lord, be present with us as we go through life, as we take a step at a time, a day at a time. And Lord, knowing that no matter what we encounter, that you are already there and that we can lean into you. Lord, be with the conference this week. We pray that all the decisions that are made would be helpful for the conference and uplifting to you. And uh, Lord, be in those times also of worship and of gathering there, that uh, your presence would just be made known among the conference. And Lord, that those who are there would leave and go back home with, uh, with a, a true fire for what is in your word and for who you are. And Lord, that that would spread through our congregations and spread through our communities, and that that light would be so visible that people would be drawn to you. Lord, as we go through the service today, I pray that you would bless the message and that it would be your words alone. We ask all of this in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, if you've got a Bible with you this morning, I would invite you to turn over to Acts chapter 2. If you know what day this is on the church calendar, that's probably not a surprise. Today is Pentecost Sunday, so we're going to 
going to go to that story, Acts chapter 2. We'll begin right at the beginning of the chapter here in just a couple of minutes. As we said, today is Pentecost. Most of you know the, the basics of this story. This is one of the most pivotal moments in all of church history. And I know I say that about several points. That's because there are more than one. But there are some really, really important ones. I mean, we talk about that with the birth of Christ at Christmas. We talk about that with the crucifixion and resurrection. And we talk about it at Pentecost especially. This was the, the keeping of a promise and the coming of the Spirit and the birth of the church as a result and the growth of the church as a result. This is a prime example of what happens when people seek God and God answers. Let me just tell you, folks, when you seek God earnestly, it might take a while. God answers. Be persistent in that. But that sort of brings us to today and leaves us going, well, what is this day all about now? What does this mean for us this many thousand years later from the event that we'll read about this morning? What is with this funny name of this day? What does this all mean for us? Let's take a look here. I'm going to read what is a fairly long passage of Scripture, but I, I really could not see myself leaving any of this out. <clears throat> so we're going to begin at verse 1 and read down through verse 41. So hang in here for a minute, but there is so much going on. I just, I, I could not, I, there was nothing really to cut. So we're going to begin at the beginning of Acts chapter 2. Listen now to this story. The scripture says this. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues of fire appeared to them and rested on each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and, and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is the only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. <clears throat> Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. 
You have made known to me the paths of life, and you will fill me with gladness of your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on this throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ. That is, he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I almost don't even know if I should preach after reading what Peter preached, you know? Some powerful words, aren't they? Let's pray for a moment and then we'll talk a little about this. Lord, as we come this morning, we look back on this first Pentecost day, the first Pentecost of the church, the birth of the church, ultimately. And Lord, we are remembering vividly that as Peter said, that, that you, Jesus, were made both Lord and Christ, the one who leads us and rules us, and also the one who loves us and saves us. Lord, we are so thankful for that. I'm thankful for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Now as we delve into this just a little farther, Lord, I ask again that you would pour your spirit on this place and all of us gathered out here. And Lord, that this message would be your words and not mine. And that through what Paul calls the foolishness of preaching, that you would be glorified. And you alone. This we ask in the name of Christ. Amen. Well, the sermon I'm preaching is sort of the sermon around the sermon. Because what Peter gave that day is, is beyond momentous. It's one of the best sermons of all time. And it doesn't have to be that long to, to be a good one, but I mean, it's long enough. But what Peter had there, I mean, I could have just read that and you would have had all that you needed today. And more than that, if, if, I, if you had just heard that message somewhere along the way, you would have had all that you ever needed because it pointed to Christ as Lord and Savior and resurrected and still living. But... I don't often pass up an opportunity, so here we are. <laughs> Pentecost was this day. This is the day that happened. Pentecost is a word that means 50th day. Uh, it's the Greek word for that day. It was the Greek name for a festival called in Hebrew Shavuot. Uh, there's no quiz later. You don't need to remember that. But what you do need to remember is that this day was called the Feast of Weeks. Now, this had been around... Since Exodus, this is one of the feasts that Moses and the Israelites are commanded to follow, that God gives to them. And uh, this, was, this was a harvest time feast. This was when the first fruits of the harvest would be brought to the temple later on, the tabernacle initially, and that farmers would be, would be watching throughout the whole season for this. They'd be watching for those first things that they were planting and growing to begin to ripen. And when that happened, they would tie a reed around the branch or the stem that had the first of the ripening fruit. So they would know later what had been the first fruits. So when they went to go harvest it, they would go pick those things separately. They would pick them first. And they would set them aside in a basket that had been woven with gold and silver. I mean, it was really beautiful. It was really exciting to, to see all of this. They would load those things on the carts. They were being pulled by oxen where they had put like garlands 
on their horns. So they've decorated the oxes. They've decorated the baskets that these first fruits are in. And then they would all kind of go in this big grand procession to Jerusalem to present these things at the temple, the sacrifice of these first fruits. It was a really joyous time. It was a celebratory time. This parade, as it went, I mean, people would come out and they would cheer it on, or they would come out and sing songs or play music. I mean, this was really just a, a jubilant, celebratory kind of day. And even if you were not a farmer, you joined in this celebration anyway. So this was for everyone. This was one that they all kept and were commanded to keep. That this, this celebration of giving back to God some of what God had given them. And so I want you to keep that picture in your mind as we look at what Pentecost is all about, because this was a joyous day anyway. This is also why there would have been such a multitude in Jerusalem on that day, even more than other days, why they would have come from all over the place. And, and remember this too, the, the Hebrew word for first fruit, which I really cannot pronounce, um, but that word means a promise to come. Isn't that interesting? But this festival was a celebration of promises to come that you had marked when you just saw them beginning to grow and ripen, but that you harvested eventually as a fully formed first fruit. So this celebratory day of those promises to come. And Pentecost remained an important day in the calendar long after it had been given to Moses and the Israelites. This was a day that was remembered for God's provision, how much he cared for them, how much he he poured, he poured on them when they were in the wilderness, how much he gave them after they got settled, how much he was giving them at the time. And honestly, we can look at this and think about how much God has given us now. That's still an important aspect to this. He pulled those first fruits and carried them in sacrifice, but everything else was yours. Think of it in that same sense as the tithe, that God asks for a little, but the abundance you were allowed to keep. This is really, God, God was good, and they were recognizing this, giving him his portion. So given all of that, the fact that the believers and the disciples are all gathered in one place that day would not have been surprising for them to be gathered up in a room like that. It was probably a large room, possibly an upper room, so the same sort of idea as the Last Supper, although an entirely different event, but they would have been gathered together, probably sharing a meal. This one would have not been solemn. This, this one would not have been solemn at all. This would have been a very joyous time. So they are there together, celebrating God's goodness, celebrating God's provision. These folks especially are probably celebrating what God had provided in Christ. But you have to remember, it hadn't been that long since Jesus had been walking with them, in fact, not very long at all. And so they're gathered together, and then it happens. This atmosphere of worship, this atmosphere of, good, of gratefulness and gratitude for what God had given is, has filled this place, and all of a sudden, promises that they were looking forward to, the promise that would come, arrived. Fulfilled in that moment of worship in that moment of power. Because you see, Jesus had promised that the Holy Spirit would come. He said that he would ask the Father, and the Father would send another comforter, that he would send the Holy Spirit. And here we are just 50 days after the Passover. That's what, again, Pentecost, 50 days is what that means, or 50th day. And it was the 50 days after the Passover. Jesus was crucified during the Passover. Jesus very likely died on the same day that the Passover lambs around Jerusalem were being slaughtered. Very, very, very likely, almost, almost certainly, that day of the week, Passover week. And so we're 50 days away from that. We're really technically, probably exactly 50 days from Holy Saturday when he had died and he is reposing in the tomb. So we're just 50 days after this. We're about 10 days after Jesus ascended. So he was on the earth with them just 10 days ago, and that promise arrives. So that's one. There are actually two here. The other one was a prophecy in the Old Testament from Joel chapter 2. It says that in the last days the Lord will pour his Spirit upon all people. It's that, that passage that Peter is quoting here. We find that in Joel chapter 2. It is that prophecy, and all of it comes together and comes to a head 
in this room with this small group of people. Because relatively, this is not a large group. There are 120 people there. I mean, Jerusalem has thousands and thousands and thousands even at this point in history. So 120 people gathered in one place. I mean, this is a, this is a dinner. This is a celebration. This is a worship service. But this is not terribly uncommon for a group like that to be gathered. They were not a huge, large group. There were more Pharisees than there were these people. So they're gathered there together. This all comes together. It all comes to a head. The Spirit arrives. And then that sermon that is given is one of the greatest ever. I mean, I, I will never rival the things that Peter preached here if I preach for 40 years. And I would venture to guess that most pastors who preach for 40 years will not get close to rivaling all that Peter said here, the arrival of the Holy Spirit. Well, first what happens is the disciples begin to speak to each other. Those flames of fire have come down. The Holy Spirit in, in a physical form is resting on them visibly. And so they begin to speak as the Spirit gives them utterance, it says. All that means is the Spirit is prompting them to speak, and so they speak. Now what I imagine is that they are still speaking their own language, because the Bible says that the other people are all hearing in their own language. It doesn't say that the Galileans are necessarily speaking in all of their languages. And that's really interesting, because what that basically means, what that implies, is that God is grabbing whatever has been said, and translating it in midair, so that when it lands at the other people's ears, they're hearing it in their own language. That would be like if somebody in the back of this parking lot only spoke Portuguese, and I'm up here preaching in English, but they're hearing me in Portuguese. That's what's happening. So it's not happening once. And there are like 15 different people groups that are all named here, all of them with different languages or different dialects or different tongues. Can you imagine that? One person speaking with no human translators around and 15 different nationalities all hearing what is being said in their own languages? Like This is an incredibly miraculous moment. I think sometimes we just talk about that and go, oh, that's cool, and then we move on. Listen, the gospel had never been in such a place to spread like it was going to as it was right here. Because God came and broke all the barriers down. And even languages at this point. You know what this is? We see so many times where different events in Jesus' life were directly countering things that had happened as part of the curses or part of the sins or those things that, that broke up humanity's relationship with God. I mean, we see that from the crown of thorns on his head even. You know, it said that the earth was going to bring forth thorns and thistles for Adam no matter what he did. And Jesus takes and undoes that and makes it a crown. You know, I mean, we see that stuff. There's more of those things, but that's one of them. This is undoing now the Tower of Babel. That happened because those people were not looking to the Lord, and so then they were divided because they were looking and made, making a name for themselves, not making a name for the Lord. And so he, he stopped that process because he knew they would go on and never look to him. But now they're looking to him, and so he brings it all back together. It brings that unity. The gospel is positioned now to spread like it never could have. And so then Peter addresses the crowd, and I love, I love the way this sermon starts out. You know it's going to be a good sermon if it has to start out by saying, I'm not drunk like you think. <laughs> I mean, you, you know something is different about these people. Something noticeably has changed. If the first thing that has to come out is, listen, it's only morning. They haven't been drinking yet. When was the last time your light was shining so hard that people looked at you a little funny? It's okay for that to happen. It really is. We're called to be a peculiar people, folks. Sometimes we don't blend in. That's okay. Not drunk like you think we are. And then Peter references the prophecy of Joel and begins to point back to the events of Christ who was killed and who died and who was resurrected by the power of God. He's referencing back to that Passover, 50 days before this one, the feast where a sacrificial death preserved life for the Israelites. And now where the sacrificial death of Christ has brought life for all of us. But this Passover was different, and this Pentecost was also very different. There would never be another one quite like it, because here the church was born. Fifty days ago it was unleavened bread and haste. This feast is all about harvest. 
and abundance. 50 days ago, it was bland and flat. How many of you have ever eaten a piece of matzo before? Is it exciting? No. Exactly. It's, it's boring. I mean, it, it's, it, makes, it, it makes the point. When we eat it during the Seder meal, we know. I mean, this had to be baked in haste. This was not for, you know, the, the pleasure of the eating. This was for the necessary eating. You know, you had to eat it and you had to get out. You needed food for the journey, but it was very bland. It was very flat because there was no time. That sacrifice had to be made. But now, we're 50 days out. Now it's abundance. Now the yeast has been given time to rise, as it were. Fifty days before, the ultimate sacrificial lamb saved from death. But now it's the church that's being called forth to rise from Passover to Pentecost, from bloody doorposts to first fruits and abundance, from a tomb in the garden to the first fruits of the harvest. You see how all of this lines up on these feasts? Do you see that connection? The church is the harvest here. Christ is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He says that foreshadows our resurrection at the end. This at Pentecost is the first fruits of the church as a result of the resurrection. It really is kind of the fruit of the tomb, if you will. And in the power of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 people were added to the church's number that day. They repented and were baptized, were made new because of the sacrifice of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. Folks, today, Pentecost Sunday, means that 50 years ago, 50 years ago, I don't think so, 50 days ago, was Holy Saturday. The Lamb of God laying dead in a tomb, but today, He has risen and ascended, and the Spirit has come, the Passover Lamb, and this is the fruit. The coming of the Holy Spirit, the birth of the church. Imagine that, as we said a minute ago, the kind of the fruit of the tomb, that that a place of death has now not only become a place of life and hope, but bears fruit. Because when Jesus defeated death, he opened the way of life for all of us. It did. It still does. And then the Spirit comes and sets us apart into the church. And you've probably heard this word, because I know I've used it, and I'm sure Danny probably did. The church in, in the Greek language is a word called ekklesia. And that's an important word, because it doesn't just mean a bunch of people. <laughs> It doesn't just mean a building where you go worship. It, it doesn't mean a bunch of people who are worshiping. You know what it means? It means the ones who are called out. I'm going to talk about looking a little different. Ecclesia means the called out ones. Called out for what? Called out to give the first fruits, the best of our harvest, to God. The best of ourselves. And then to go in the power of the Holy Spirit and bring the rest of the abundance of the harvest that is there for us to bring. This is a day to celebrate because with the power of the Spirit, we can do that. We can do more than we could ever possibly imagine because it's God ultimately working through us, doing things that we could never do without Him. Because that is how God works. He takes whatever little meager effort we have and multiplies it in ways that we could never accomplish. It multiplies our efforts through that power of the Holy Spirit beyond our ability, beyond even our understanding sometimes. We rely on that. And we walk in that. I want you to see a couple of things as we kind of begin to wind this up about this day. The first is this, that the Spirit came in a moment of gathering and a moment of worship. I don't, I don't mean that to say that the Spirit does not touch us individually, even when we're off by ourselves in places, because He certainly does. I've, I've had times where I've been taking a walk, or just taking a drive by myself, or one of my favorites is once in a while to just go like take a hike. And I, don't, I don't get to do that that often, but sometimes you get out in those places where you're just kind of out in the middle of the woods by yourself, and you're surrounded by the beauty of creation, and you just really kind of get in touch it's quiet in your heart, and sometimes it's not a big roaring fire. Sometimes it's just that little touch that you just know that's God talking, or God just letting him know, letting you know he's present with you. So yeah, the Holy Spirit can definitely move when we are by ourselves. But it is important. It's not optional. It is important to come together in one place. Not optional. Make that clear. One place, one purpose. 
to celebrate what God has done, so that's worship, to look for the coming of the first fruits, and we do that a lot of times when we're examining the scripture and we see the things that God has promised, or we learn those truths that never change, promises to come, and then gather together in one mind and one spirit and seek the Lord. Folks, God moves in those times. Absolutely, he does. And if you have something you're truly seeking God for, it is great to get on your face in your house or in your room and seek him. Absolutely, and you should do that. But I'm telling you, grab some other people to seek him with you. Because it was when these were gathered together that the Holy Spirit came. I mean, do you not think that God could have dropped the Holy Spirit on these 120 people individually if they were all in different places? Absolutely, he could have. But he didn't do that. He waited until they were gathered together, and I think that's very important for us. So coming together, even like we are right now, like I appreciate that all of you are out here, because this is an odd day, you know? Normally we'd be gathered in our sanctuaries, and we'd be singing songs and doing those things together in our buildings and what is comfortable and normal. And here we are on the parking lot or out in the sun or, or however, and we're still here. We're still gathered, and that's awesome. But we need to carry that with us always. Do not forsake the fellowship of believers, it says in another point. I believe that's in Hebrews. So coming together is very, very important. Because, I mean, if you want to you want to see the church grow, you want to see the church become more effective, you want to see you become more effective in your witness, folks, it starts in Pentecost-style upper rooms. It starts gathering together in sanctuaries and gathering together in homes and gathering together, Period. Seeking God and worshiping together. That's the first thing. The second is this, that when God moves, sometimes we are touching and reaching people that we don't even realize we're touching and reaching at first. That's kind of an important thing for character and integrity just in general. But it says that the multitude heard the sound and then they gathered, probably outside the room, to hear you know, through a window or whatever what was happening. The 120 gathered in that room did not go looking for them. This does not mean that we have an excuse not to do outreach. P.S. Doesn't mean that. We do those things to reach out to our community, but what it does mean is that our witness may draw other people to us, or people may be watching when we don't even realize it. Because these disciples, when they gathered in that room, they were probably there to celebrate this feast. They had no idea that by the end of it, that the Holy Spirit would have arrived, and that people would be gathered out, multitudes outside the place, and that Peter would suddenly be preaching. None of them knew that. But they were there. They were ready. Ask God to let your light shine in such a way that even when you don't know that someone is seeing or hearing, that what they see would draw them to you and draw them to God and to make them say, what is different about these people? What is the meaning of this? Why are they drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning? Maybe not that last one. You see what I mean, though? If we let God work through us and move through us, then our prayer should be that no matter who sees us whenever they see us, or no matter who hears us, maybe they're two aisles over at the grocery store, and something that you happen to say reaches their ears and for whatever reason draws them towards you. Maybe you were just kind to somebody who was not so kind to you, and they hear that and go, why did you do that? What makes that? What makes you different? I'm not talking about preaching sermons in aisle seven. Uh, I'm talking about living a witness that allows the Holy Spirit to shine through all the time. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's, that's where we need to be. That is our call. We want to make a difference in the lives of others. We want to reach the area for Christ. Folks, we need the Spirit to go with us and shine through us. That is our call. The chapter before this one, Acts chapter 1, has a really amazing quote that, that is from Jesus. And it says, you know, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. But what does it go right on and say after that? You will be my witnesses. Not you might, not you could be if you want to be. You will be my witnesses. Which means that when we plug in with Jesus, that stuff should shine out of us. It says you'll be my witnesses in all Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and under the ends of the earth. There are four things there, and that's important. Jerusalem is where they were. That would be like Elk View for us. Judea was the wider area, so we could call that Kanawha County. Samaria is where you don't want to be. If you're a WVU fan, that's Pittsburgh. Uh, could be any number of places. Samaria, they didn't want to go there. 
the Jews and Samaritans, people, Israelites and Samaritans did not get along. And one did not want to be in those other places. And Jesus still says to them, you're going to be my witness there. So right where you are, the area around where you are, maybe where you don't want to be. And then finally, there are no more boundaries and unto the ends of the earth. Folks, that's literally everywhere. That's a, that's a big mission. That's a lot, isn't it? Sounds like it could be a little too much to take on. And I can almost, and I have heard, and I'm not, I would never point out who, but I have heard people say, you know, we'd like to do these things, but we're just too small, or we don't have the right age demographic, or whatever. Baloney. There were 120 people in a place that had no technology, they had no cars, they had none of these resources that we have, and they turned the world upside down. And if 120 still sounds like it's big, okay, there were 12 before that. There are more of you on this parking lot. They changed the world. How did they do that? Through the power of the Holy Spirit. Wasn't in their power. Wasn't in their efforts. Wasn't in their experience. It wasn't in their ages. It wasn't in their money. It wasn't in their jobs. It wasn't in whatever kind of Mercedes ox cart they might have been driving down the road. It wasn't in any of that. It was in the power of the Holy Spirit. And through that, they changed the world. And folks... Just because fire is not falling from heaven visibly any longer, it still could. I'm not saying it couldn't. I don't think we're past those kind of things. God could do that absolutely if he wants to. But what I know is this, the Holy Spirit still comes. The Holy Spirit still fills us and still moves. And if they can do it, and we are to follow their example, folks, for us, Elkview is only the beginning of what God can do. There is no reason we can't either. So go into your Jerusalem or into your Judea or into your Samaria. That's the hard one. Whatever your Samaria is, you don't want to go there. If God calls you there, congratulations. You get to go be a witness. But you know what's cool? Is that by the end of it, you will have changed whatever that Samaria is into something that is amazing through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's really God who affects the change. We have to obey and follow and be the witness and whatever else. God does the harder work. God does more than we could ever do. Take that power of the Holy Spirit with you. Folks, this is Pentecost. It is the day of first fruits, the day of promises kept. So ask God to give the fruit. There's another passage where Paul is talking about witnessing and somebody, he's basically explaining that it's not on him. It's not on the other people. It's what God does. He says, I planted the seed. And Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. And, or God gives the increase in some of your translations, if that sounds more familiar. But I love what he says next. He basically says, so then, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything. But only God who makes things grow, who gives the increase. It is God's power working through the Holy Spirit, working through us, that accomplishes those things. Folks, our efforts could never do it. But through God, nothing is impossible. I promise you that the Holy Spirit is still active. I promise that he's still here. He is still as close as the call of the name of the Lord, and it is through the Spirit's power that we accomplish anything at all. Folks, he has called and he has promised, and one thing that I will say for sure is that God keeps his promises. If he says we're going to be his witnesses, he's going to go with us. Now, what we read today, I mean, that's amazing, but that story doesn't end there. Because this was the birth of the church, but what are we? We are the church. Same church, one church for all time, all believers. We still have that same call and mission. Look back to the Passover and look to the cross and the tomb and, and then look 50 days later to those promises kept. Our Pentecost is now and always. So look and see the hope of Christ. Ask that God would give us the first fruits, to give us the fruit that comes from the tomb, life from a place of death, life when we lay down our own, life eternal and abundant, and that he would give us the power and the zeal to share that with the world that so desperately needs to be set aflame with the love of God. Folks, I, I'm just going to say this, and... People might balk at it, and I really don't care. Right now, you're going to see a whole lot of things set aflame with a lot of flags that have a lot of different colors on them about 
parades and being proud of things and all of that stuff. Folks, we have a different fire and it's a better fire and we need to set the world on fire with that. That's the kind of love the world needs, okay? That is the kind of love that always wins. That is the kind of love we need to share with the world. Set the world aflame with the love of God. That is our call. And the question then is simply this, will you answer? That is the call. Will you answer? Strong stuff, isn't it? A lot of lessons there from Peter. Let me just say this, and I'm, I'm going to... We're going to attempt to sing a little chorus here in a second, and uh, then we'll close. But um, If you need more of that fire, if you need more of that zeal, if you need more of that, that push, you need that hope, maybe you just need it all set on fire on you, in you again, ask God to do that. Folks, that Pentecost is basically not over. The Holy Spirit still moves, still comes, still works, and is still very active. So ask him to do it again in your heart. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. If you know that, sing along with it. Come, Holy Spirit, I need thee. Come, sweet Spirit, I pray. Come in thy strength and thy power. Come in thine own gentle way. And God is good. All the time. <clears throat> I'm going to uh, get ready to close us here with a word of prayer. Let me say again, thank you for coming out and hanging out in the parking lot. <laughs> no, it's not what anybody really had in mind for this week. but And thank you again for your prayers and for your help of us. I know I've said that on a one call and twice already in this service, but I just want you to know how much we appreciate every single one of you. Because I know that even if you didn't call or bring things by, I know we were being prayed for and we felt that and it carried us through and and uh man that that means the world and you might say well all i can do is pray listen folks prayer is doing more than anything else that could be done so thank you for that um i i don't know of any other specific announcements aside from the ones we had earlier we'll send an email around this afternoon that had those announcements on it it'll come with the youtube link to the video so just Watch for those uh, in your emails. They'll go around this afternoon. Uh, no evening service tonight. And uh, we'll be away at conference starting sometime Tuesday. We'll be here probably into late Tuesday morning or early Tuesday afternoon before we head up to Buck Cannon. Um, I will say this. Even though we are gone at conference, if you have a need or something comes up, please call me. Uh, conference is not a vacation, and even if I were on vacation, if it was an emergency, I'd want you to call me anyway. But but if something comes up or something is needed, please call me. I can duck out of a conference session for a minute and take a phone call, um, even if I'm running the soundboard. There are other people that are also going to be helping to run the sound, so I would not be like leaving the whole conference with no sound guy or any of that. So what, whatever comes up, if, if anything comes up, call. My cell phone will be with me all the time, so don't don't be afraid to do that. Don't apologize for doing it. Uh, it'll be fine. So I'll give you that heads up before we before we head out. Anything else I'm forgetting? Okay. Well, let's close then.
And now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of the love of God the Father and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And may he empower us to go into the world rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you and remain in you now and always. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Go in peace.